following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Bipedal Pokemon are always kind of a source of contention in the community, and from my research, there's kind of a lot of people that just don't like Incineroar's design, especially when I went back and I kind of found posts from many years ago when Sun and Moon was releasing. I am not one of those people. This is one of my absolute favorite Pokemon designs, and the wrestling aesthetic with the flaming belt kind of speaks to me as a fan of mid to late 90s wrestling. Its signature move is a dark flavored clothesline, and it's classified as the heel Pokemon, which if you don't know, that means the bad guy in wrestling lingo, babyface means good guy, heel means bad guy, and it's pretty cool how they classified this one considering that it's a dark type Pokemon. Outside of that, I do get Major King vibes from Tekken, and to no one's surprise, I also like that design. This week we'll be continuing the Alolan Summer with our first non-regional variant with Incineroar in Pokemon Red. And before we hop in, whether you are someone new, maybe you're someone who just doesn't think about this sort of thing, or if you are a returning subscriber like C Duke Net Architecture, take a second, hit that like button if you enjoy solo run content and tell me how you guys feel about Incineroar, maybe the starters in general. I think there are probably some Decidui fans out there, but I just like to hear your opinions. Like always, the rules for the run are in the description and there's an unlisted video if you want to dive deeper into the rules and the setup that I use. And the last thing I want to mention here is I did not create this front sprite. It's amazing. It belongs to Pat Ackerman. So huge shout out to him for giving me permission to use those and I'll have one of his socials linked below as well. And with that out of the way, let's just sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop and we can just dive into it. Let's start off with the opening rifle battle and today we'll be going against the water starter Blastoise because it's just a tanky little boy. Two darkest lariats will take it out and while we go through this minimal early game let's take a deeper look into Incineroar. As for the stats they are solid pretty much all the starters are but there are some hangups when we look at Incineroar as a whole. Now the main takeaways here is that it has a really solid 115 base attack stat. Everything else is pretty decent but the 60 base speed does mean that it's something that we're going to have to focus on in terms of vitamins as we head towards the middle and end game. As for the learn set, I'm actually going to be using the Gen 7 learn set this week, unlike the last two where Gen 8 was just superior. Specifically, we are on the Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon learn set just because you learn things a little bit earlier like Fire Fang and you get Double Kick whereas you don't in the regular version. This week I'm going to cover the extra moves as we get to them, but two of them are in the starting learn set so let's touch on those real quick. Darkest Lariat was Incineroar signature move in gen 7 they made it a tr in gen 8 and here it's just a 85 base power move it's pretty solid it has no additional effects but this move is supposed to ignore any changes to the target's defense and evasion but that's kind of hard to translate and it's not really going to matter much since dark is actually a special type pre gen 4 split bulk up is a boosting move it ups your attack and defense by one stage each and moves like this in gen 1 are very powerful in the early to late game because once you start getting those badge boosts it is going to provide you two separate badge boost glitch opportunities and let's kind of leave the moves right there for now. Outside of facing this single mandatory bug catcher which really isn't an issue because we're a fire type, there's nothing else to see or talk about here, we can take a look at Brock. And we'll go into more of this in a second, but Darkest Lariat is our best choice here. Brock's rocks have poor special and Dark is not resisted. Since we are here at minimum battles, this means I cannot two-shot the Geodude. And I'm also missing just a little bit of help from the Weedle earlier. And if Geodude goes for straight tackle, you can get a little low here, but we do make it past. And we gain a massive two levels from this part of the fight alone. As for Onyx, we do not outspeed. And the best case scenario happens here, it goes for Bide. And since we have a very high chance of a two shot with darkest lariat that means that this one is free and just like that i do take the first badge moving ahead let's talk about some of the challenges and what might hold incineroar back from ranking high on the tier list like iron thorns before it it just has a lot of special moves but its best stat by far is its attack stat bulk up is a very interesting move but when you got things like darkest lariat which uses the special stat and ember which also uses special you can kind of see where i'm going with this i just think 
runs like this are interesting to see how these future gen designs fit into the gen 1 mold and i'll go on record right now to say that i think the physical special split was the single best change that pokemon has ever done the only thing to note before mount moon is that after this kakuna i do hit level 14 and we get our next new move now firefang is making a return from the iron thorns video it's nothing really special but it's kind of the bridge between ember and something like flamethrower later down the line and the increased damage on top of stab it's always welcome i don't love the 95 percent accuracy but it could be worse it's worth noting that things like darkest lariat and firefang they would both be physical moves if this were post physical special split post gen 4 and that's going to be the last time i mention that but the run it would just be so much better if these moves were physical in mount moon there's no reason to not pick up some extra trainers because we need to ensure that we keep cruising by this early game so it's not going to cost us any time first up is the super nerd i mentioned him nearly every video but the experience guys the experience is just that good next up is the double grass last and then i can pick up the hiker because we learned double kick at level 16 and make short work of it and when i finish up mount moon i hit level 19 and this is going to be the beauty of that medium slow leveling group we've seen a lot of runs do a lot more in the early game and actually be lower level and i guess i really never go into detail about leveling groups so let's do that now you can find this information on bulbapedia if you really want to dive into the numbers but this chart right here is about the best representation of leveling groups that i can find now you can ignore those lines for the erratic and the fluctuating groups since this is gen 1 but focus on the purple medium slow line and the yellow medium fast line don't worry too much about what the left side actually means just know that the lower the line the faster you gain levels and you can see that up until your 30s medium slow is actually faster than fast and then up until about level 65 it's faster than the medium fast group then it kind of trails down after that and then you can see the brown line for the slow leveling group and if you just want to know what that leveling group is about and why the hassle is so hard to overcome in runs here's your answer it's just so much slower the name is very accurate but this is kind of a representation of the leveling groups i don't show it much but suffice it to say and to kind of boil all of this down into one sentence leveling groups are weird and their names don't really make any sense as for rival number two i did not like this fight in practice and i think we all know why without spending a ton of extra time one shotting the pidgeotto was just out of the question but i could outspeed it this means that it has one chance for a sand attack and unfortunately it does hit one here but luckily this was the type of run where it really didn't matter i don't miss any of my moves and i was able to kind of clean this one up nicely and get past one of the first hurdles of the run as for nugget bridge and the route to bill's house there's not really much to say i keep it to the minimum track we have great answers for all the pokemon here and i guess now it's time to talk about misty because we're a fire type and usually that's kind of a hassle but we'll see how it's done today Starmie is up first. We outspeed. Darkest Lariat is a one shot. That's all we need to say. But it's Starmie that's always the problem here. Bubble Beam hits really hard, but since we got all these extra levels, it really doesn't matter. But we don't outspeed. And first turn, worst case scenario strikes. We get hit with a Bubble Beam crit, and we go all the way down to just a mere 10 HP. And to top it all off, our Darkest Lariat, which has a really high chance to one shot, just quite misses the mark. And now we got to get a little bit of luck here. Arceus blesses us today. We get an X defend, that means we can take it out on the next turn. And Incineroar avoids an early reset and we get past one of the tougher badges in the run. And just like we mentioned with the stats, it was the 60 base speed that was the problem here. If we could have outsped Starmie, this would have been a much safer battle. But just like with rival number two, we just simply cannot afford to waste a bunch of time leveling up. Because the whole point of this series is to beat the game as fast as possible. And I figured this was the best way to do it. You gotta take a little bit of risk, guys. Doing the very safe and consistent strategies doesn't always pay off, now does it? Now we can take this thing all the way down to the SSN. And there's some slight change-ups today because I'm heading to the right and that means my friends we're getting a tm i honestly don't like that much we're getting rest i think if you're doing a first playthrough this move is fine but i think if you're refining and optimizing runs there's just no need for it but in this very special case i do need it and without spoiling too much it's because we have a very big menace at the end of the run and no real answer for it outside of that i do pick up body slam we do fight the gentleman and get the rare candy those aren't too interesting we don't have to go too far into that now we can take a look at rival number three and when i'm recording audio this 
would usually be the part where I say Body Slam changes life because of our attack stat. But that's not really the case here. Darkest Lariat with its 127 effective power is just a better move on a lot of levels for quite a while. Body Slam is definitely good to have and I do appreciate it being on the learn set. But for a fight like this, all you need to do is go for Darkest Lariat. Don't overcomplicate it too much. It's easy to look at the special stat and be like, hey, it's lower than the attack stat, so use the, the physical move, but that's not the case here, my friends. And as for Surge, forget everything I just said because Body Slam is the answer here. Now, specifically for Raichu, it just has a really good special stat, so you'd really want to use physical moves. It does have Growl. That can be a little bit annoying. But at the end of the day, the medium slow leveling group means that we're not under leveled here. We can easily get through this one. There's not much to talk about. And the only thing I'll say is that it's a damn shame that we can't learn Thunderbolt because this run would be... I don't know how much better this run would be without it. I don't want to spoil anything, but man, that Gyarados coverage would have helped. Now we can skip over Rock Tunnel. We have all the tools needed to make that trivial. We can pick right back up in Celadon. And as usual, the first order of business is the Rocket Hideout. And today, guys, I'm going to do a little bit something different. I'm going to foreshadow this a little bit, but I do something a little bit extra. I'm not going to reveal that to the end of the run to when it becomes relevant, because I guess I don't want you guys to see it coming. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But we are picking up high money items like usual. We want to get the most vitamins that we can, especially with our speed stat. And as for Giovanni, Darkest Lair, Lariat once again is putting in some work. It's kind of similar to the Executor run that we just did. Dragon Hammer just didn't have anything to resist it. Darkest Lariat's kind of the same way in a lot of situations and it can really just blast through stuff. Once we're done with that, I'm immediately heading down to Erica's gym. I don't really need to tell you guys why the top matchup. It's just too good to pass up. Erica's gym gives a lot of money and if you're only doing one buy, one shopping moment like I do in my runs, it's always worth it if you can swing it. Most runs can't because Erica's a pretty powerful gym leader in red and blue but I digress let's take a look at the fight we're not under leveled here so it's, this fight's not really a problem but fire fang cannot one shot and the fact that we're fire type we resist grass she's gonna deep prioritize most of her moves and go for rap so looking ahead and after practicing this fight a good bit you want to go for bulk up here two bulk ups are ideal but since rap wastes so much time I just want to get rid of it now the range to get the one shot here is pretty good but it's not guaranteed but luckily I do get it here and we move on to the worst Pokemon of all time Tangela here, I elect to set up my second bulk up to make the rest of the fight just one shots. And wouldn't you know that Tangela just wants to make my life even more annoying by using Bind, so it wastes even more time. I might as well have just set up on the Victory Bell at this point. But when I'm set up, I do take it out, and the main thing that the plus two on our attack from bulk up does is allows us just to one shot the Vile Plume. And this fight wasn't great. You could probably just go straight Fire Fang, but I think the math, if you add it up, you'll save a turn or two if you just went for two bulk ups and then straight Body Slam sweep. But when you take into account the wraps and the bonds, I don't know, this fight wasn't the fastest, but it was pretty safe. But more importantly, it gets us that cash money for our one Celadon Mark buy. Now you might notice, I never talk about this, but I have my bag number on the screen. It's uh, You can only hold 20 items in Gen 1. It's a pretty archaic system, and I'm actually full right here, so I have to kind of manage stuff a little bit different. But when it's all said and done, I'm able to afford five Carbos just because our uh, low speed, we've talked about that earlier, it's gonna help us out a lot. And a single protein, We'll polish off this buy and we're done here. We never have to shop again for this run. As for rival number four, it's just the body slam show. Notice how we're not healing a lot. This is more like reminiscent of my early Mewtwo or Nidal King runs I did a long time ago. But you just kind of have a lot of variety with Incineroar and you don't need to heal that often. Now, you might notice that we're also out of Darkest Lariats here, but it doesn't matter because at this level, Fire Fangs can still one shot the Gastlies and we're getting a free heal coming up. So there's not much more worth talking about for this. Pokemon Tower segment. When that's over, annoyingly enough, I do have to deposit a few items just because of backspace. It's kind of a problem. For some of the really elite runs, you never have to do this, but here we do. But it is what it is. I thought it was worth mentioning. Now we can take it all the way down to the Safari Zone. We're picking up the final HMs of the run, but the things like the Protein, the Carbos, and the Full Restore, those are all pretty key items. We need those vitamins pretty bad. And we'll talk more about the Full Restore later. I've mentioned it, but we'll go into it a little bit later as well. That's all we need to talk about for this section. And now we're going to take it over to Sylph. Just like you see with a lot of runs, this is where you kind of make your hard pivot into the late game and kind of get yourself set up for what you're going to use for those really tough battles that are going to be coming up in the run. First up is the 10th floor. There's always good stuff up here. Rare Candy, Carbos, but today Earthquake is going to be the premier move that we're going to want the most. And I'm also going to be picking up a couple of extra battles today. Now when you fight the Arbok Grunt right before the card key on this warp panel here, there's a scientist that gives some pretty good
good experience. I go ahead and I fight him. Now, annoyingly enough, I do get paralyzed here, so that's kind of annoying. I do fight another extra battle, but before we do that, I do head up to the seventh floor, and I think you know what this means, guys. It's time for Swords Dance. Now, I love Swords Dance. It's a very powerful move. Now, a lot of these cross-gen runs just get Swords Dance for whatever reason, and I can't say I'm a, the biggest fan of this always becoming the strategy, but we needed it for Gyarados here. Bulk Up is a crazy good move, and since Badge Boost will give you special down the line, I really wanted to fit it in, but the fact of the matter is, Gyarados, really oppressive. There's not much more to say, but Swords Dance, Earthquake are now on the learn set. It is what it is. I needed it unless I wanted to level up like 10 more levels. That's probably an exaggeration, but you get what I'm saying. The second extra battle I do is right next to rival number five's warp point. It's another scientist. This one gives a ton of experience. Now that we have Earthquake, it's two easy one shots. And this was so we could hit level 39 right here. It was very key. And normally I wouldn't want to do extra battles when we're seeing how fast a run could be, but I could not afford to use a rare candy here. This was the only way I could see around this conundrum. And now my friends, I think we can take a look at rival number five. Pidgeot is first, and believe it or not my friends, this is the reason for five Carbos and the reason for the extra battles, because we need to outspeed this Pidgeot because it has Sand Attack. Now, I went for a YOLO strat here. You need two Swords Dance for this fight, and I go ahead and I just set them up with no regard for the Sand Attacks. It ends up working out, but what I do is I kind of Fat Finger a Darkest Lariat, and Swords Dance doesn't do anything for that, so it's still a two shot, so I waste a turn, but luckily, all I do is take a decent amount of damage rather than a Sand Attack, but I am set up to plus four. I have a lot of attack, and you know what that means. I'm going to start mowing down the rest of this team. So luckily, the mistake didn't cost me, and from there, the next three Pokemon, I can just use Body Slam on. Now, for the Blastoise, you do have to swap over for Earthquake. It's a little bit stronger, and it guarantees you that one shot. And when you're doing some extra battles, and maybe you think that, hey, this is going to cost you some time, it really doesn't, because you can see those two extra battles made this one a pretty quick battle, and it's just going to kind of snowball from there. Like, if you keep up with your levels, hit certain breakpoints at certain times, you're going to start saving turns and saving turns in various battles and you will get that time back and then some so it's very important for me to do those two extra battles hit level 39 here i made a couple of mistakes but it wasn't that bad rival number five usually a pretty tough fight but i was pretty proud of how we overcame it here and when we get done with that oh i got sabrina's juicy ass just waiting on me we're a dark type you all know dark is immune to psychic that means sabrina is practically free that's why we're gonna go to her right now i don't bother healing i don't bother getting my PP back because I just I simply don't need it. Now when we finally get into this battle here, you might notice that I do set up one Swords Dance. That's just to get some one shot ranges. Now if you do the math and let's just say the Venomoth takes two hits, Alakazam takes two hits, four total Pokemon, that's six turns. If you set up one Swords Dance and one shot everything, that's five turns. It will save you just a slight bit of time and that's kind of what I think about when I'm optimizing these runs. But it's Sabrina. As a dark type, it's a free fight so I always enjoy it when that's the case. There's just not many runs where you can just kick Alakazam's teeth in with no worry at all. Now let's clean up the rest of these badges real quick. We got Koga up next. I do learn Flamethrower at level 44. I replaced Darkest Lariat because we just got done with Koga's Psychic types. So there's not really much more of a use for it considering that we're immune to Psychic damage. So it just doesn't really matter that much. Execute or Executor later might be a problem. So it's just an overall better move, has higher effective power. And you just kind of need that Body Slam, Swords Dance, Earthquake, core that's why we got rid of it i know i'm not talking about this battle but we don't even need to set up swords dance we have earthquake this one's over pretty quick and the speed badge boost for something with 60 base speed is very helpful indeed now let's keep it moving on now we got a swift swim down to cinnabar island there's no need for anything extra and for a split second when i looked into incineroar's eyes i thought maybe he actually knew what the 28th tm was today i thought about asking him if it was actually Tombstoner, brother. And then I got a little bit intimidated, and now I think we can just take a look at Blaine. This one's gonna be pretty much the same as Koga. We have Earthquake, there's no need to really set up. We can just kind of blast this one down, and just like that, we're looking down at the eighth gem of the run. And as for Giovanni, it's not quite as simple as Koga and Blaine. I do need to set up a single Swords Dance. This allows me to outspeed Doug Trio, not get hit by a Sand Attack, and more importantly, it allows me to hit the one-shot ranges on both Nidos and on the Ride on, so it's pretty good. Now, 
Now, what I will say, I'll give Cinderar a lot of praises here. I don't need to heal after this fight because you have such a high PP reserve. I guess that sounds kind of funny, but it is what it is. But I don't need to heal or use any elixirs before going to rival number six. And I think we can just go straight there. Pidgeot is first. I've said this about a hundred times already, but this is the point of the game where Pidgeot no longer has sand attack. So thank God. This means I can set up with full impunity here. I need two swords dance for this fight. I'm not too worried about the damage. So I set up and then I kind of started a little mini body slam sweep. I do it all the way up to the Rhyhorn. Then you have to go for Earthquake. I don't even need Flamethrower for Execute since we're boosted. It doesn't matter that we don't outspeed the Alakazam. And this one's a done deal, right? But we Earthquake the Blastoise and we crit. That means we don't knock it out. So what does it do? It goes for a Hydro Pump and my life flashes before my eyes. I go all the way down to 34 HP. This is very reminiscent of the Misty fight early, but thankfully we do survive. A second Earthquake takes it out and now now, there's only five fights to worry about left in the game. But that Hydro Pump did surprise me a little bit. I was kind of clenching. I kind of let out an audible sigh. Now, when we're looking ahead at the Elite Four, I cannot afford to use candies yet. So I have to fight Lorelai in my current state. On top of that, I always talk about how I like to skip the rare candy in Victory Road, but today I cannot afford that luxury. I need to get it. And you guys can kind of see where this is going. It's going for Gyarados. Gyarados is the problem. And the level that we need to be for him is gonna impact us just a little bit on the other fights because we're not as strong as you would be in a maybe a run that doesn't have to worry about it but that's really all I'm willing to say about it now I guess all we can do is kind of look at it and see how it goes so without further ado let's dive into the elite four Dugong is first and we need plus six to our attack so we need to set up the full three swords dance. I'm not too worried about the damage that she's going to give back to us here. What is annoying is if she decides to use growl which she does here but if you look on the bright side of things keep a glass half full type of mentality it does give you an additional badge boost. So when we're done with this one we do boost ourselves to plus six. We have a ton of attack and we're gonna need every ounce that we can get when we finish off the dugong. And it's all because of Cloyster. Now, we're gonna earthquake it and one-shot it and it's gonna look like it's nothing, but trust me guys, Cloyster has such high defense and Clamp does so much damage. The computer loves to cheat with Clamp. I'm just gonna call it out on that, but it's not really that bad. Now, outside of there, we could just go on the sweep. It's worth noting that the rest of this fight did not require plus six, only the Cloyster. So you're so strong at this point. You're so much stronger than you actually needed to be that it's a very easy sweep. And Lorelai's down. But as a fire type, there really wasn't ever a question about it. This one's pretty easy. And speaking of easy, it's our old pal Bruno back again for another week of getting beat up on. And there's not much to say about this one. Is there really ever with Bruno? I do set up one swords dance just because the onyxes have a lot of defense. And we talked about how the turns add up. If you just use one swords dance, you can knock off two turns in the match. But I digress. We set up one swords dance. We sweep through this one. And now we're moving on to Agatha. Now I'm never going to be able to outspeed the Gengar. I do set up one sword stance. You might be wondering why because Earthquake's going to one-shot everything anyway outside of the Golbat. It's for a very important reason. We'll get to it in a second. But there's some general annoying uh, Agatha shenanigans here. But ultimately, I get off the Earthquake. We move on to the Golbat. Now, I can't one-shot this thing. I do get it really low. But thankfully, she makes a pivot into the Haunter. And I guess I can talk about why we did the one sword stance. It's because it allows me to actually outspeed the middle part of her team. And it makes things a little bit more consistent. So since she swapped out of the Golbat, it's already hurt. I can one-shot the other things. This is pretty much a done deal. Now, I always say the last Gengar has like one of the worst learn sets ever. It's pretty bad. It's not very good. So we get past this one and that's a done deal. We got Lance coming up next, but first guys, let's take you way earlier in the run and let's talk about something real quick. Way back at the Rocket Hideout, the thing I didn't want to show you guys is that I picked up the TM for Double Edge. This isn't the first time I used this strategy. The 15 extra effective power of this over Body Slam does make that difference sometimes. So that means we get it, and now we saved all 11 rare candies. This means we can get up to level 63. That's about the best I can do without pouring a lot of extra time, and this is what I thought I needed to do to win this one. Now it's worth noting, we do have one last new move for the run, but the way everything came out with optimizations, we're not even going to learn it. It's called Flare Blitz. This is like 
the premier physical uh, fire move. It's special here, obviously, but 120 base damage. It's essentially like a super double edge, I guess, for fire types. It would be very interesting to see if you got this earlier, but we're not even going to use it, but I did need to at least mention it. So we're going into Lance with a rest, swords dance, double edge, and earthquake core. It looks a little unconventional, but this was really the only way I could consistently do this fight. So without further ado, I say we just take a look at Lance and let's see how it goes. The long-awaited show off is here, and there's two lose conditions here. Number one is a Hydra Pump crit. You cannot survive it. It'll just take you out. There's nothing you can do. The second thing is if you get a crit. Now, with 11.72% chance to crit, it's not really that good, so you'll likely never hardly see a crit in this run. But here, out of all the places in the game to see a crit, we do see one, and that means, my friends, Incineroar has its very first reset of the run. But there's no shame in that. Gyarados has caused many a reset, and he'll cause many more resets in the future to come. On attempt two, let's talk about how this fight's supposed to work. I use Swords Dance, I get my boost, I get a minor little special badge boost here, and I get hit with a Hydro Pump. It does about half of my health, it does a lot, but that turn one Swords Dance does allow Double Edge to pretty cleanly one shot, but it has recoil damage, and we go down to 58 HP. It's not great, but that's why we have rest on the learn set. Now from here, you can take a risk if you want. Of course, I'm gonna go for the risk, so I go for another Swords Dance setup. I get hit with a dragon rage i'm all the way down to 18 hp and now we just kind of rest up and we want to come out of here with the full complement of three swords dance plus six on our attack and be at least fairly healthy just for the later parts of the fight i opted not to play this one safe i get down to about half hp but i am set up and i just kind of decide that half hp is good enough so i start to go on the sweep now the dragon airs aren't flying top so earthquake can just take them out there's no need to take any recoil damage and the main reason to get plus six on your attack stat here is that it allows the resisted double edge to actually one shot the aerodactyl it does take us down to 68 hp but that's just fine that's more than enough to one shot the dragonite but it turns out guys that we're really lucky or unlucky in this case we crit for a second time that means we don't knock it out in one hit thankfully dragonite goes for a slam it misses that means we're able to take it out on the next turn and just like that lance is down so this one was pretty consistent but let's not rest just yet we still got one one battle remaining. Pidgeot is up first, and there's no messing around here. I want to set up all of my Swords Dance, get to that plus six attack, and go on the sweep. Now, it's worth noting that if you didn't have to face Gyarados and use this weird breast Swords Dance learn set, you could probably save some turns because it's much easier if you have a fire move to deal with Executor, but we don't have that luxury. We had to do what we had to do for Gyarados. So here we are. We set up all the way. We take a little bit of damage, but it's okay because we have rest if we need it. And unfortunately, we do level up after we take out the Pidgeot. That means we don't get the extra speed, but it doesn't matter. And Roar's at 873 attack. And let's see that put in some work today. We've talked about Alakazam. We're immune to psychic types. It can set up 10 reflex if it wants to. We're still going to one shot it. And Earthquake's just so useful in this fight. It can take down the Rhydon with ease with our boost as well as the Arcanine. Normally a pretty thick little puppy, but today it's no match for this massive attack stat. And now it's time for Executor. We're a fire type, but unfortunately circumstances have dictated that we cannot have a fire move. And this is why we need the plus six. Thankfully, we are healthy enough to be able to take it out with with a single double edge but guys once again i crit and it cost me yet another one shot this is insanely lucky for 11 percent crit and normally crits are pretty cool but you don't want crits i'll just say this again in gen 1 crits ignore your stat changes so it's just using our base attack for these calculations that's why we're not one shotting we take it out and the end's going to be pretty anticlimactic at plus six that guarantees the earthquake will one shot the blast toys and that's the run over and that, my friends, is it. Incineroar has done it. With a final time of 2 hours, 5 minutes, and 14 seconds, we can now make Incineroar's card. And I just gotta say, Pat Ackerman, I don't even think he does sprites anymore for commissions or anything like that, but this sprite is just, it's ah, chef's kiss. It's so good. But let's go ahead and uh, roll out this tier list. We'll see where Incineroar ranks. And I think right before Alolan Executor, after Obstagoon makes sense. It's a really good time. But 
unfortunately, it just it didn't learn anything naturally, like a Thunder Fang or maybe get Rock Slide or something like that. So it just had some trouble with Gyarados, but there's no shame in that. I've already mentioned that. I tried really hard to make this run good, and I think this is about as good as it gets, honestly. And I just had a lot of fun doing this Pokemon. I say that a lot, but this summer doing these kind of cross-gen runs, I love Gen 7. Gen 7 kind of gets a lot of hate, but I just absolutely love Sun and Moon. But I think that makes sense. Raichu, still a very strong number one, but I think maybe next week when we get to look at Alolan Ninetales, I think potentially Alolan Raichu might have a match there because they're very similar Pokemon, but I digress. I don't want to talk about that too much. And as always, special shout out to my channel members. I really do appreciate the support. It helps me out a lot, and it's nice to know that some of you have my back. So I really do appreciate you. And if you're hearing my voice right now, you're a real one. Type real one down in the chat just so I know you made it this far. I always like to see who makes it this far into the videos because that precious sweet nectar called watch time is very important to me. It's very discouraging when you make a video, you spend a lot of time on it and you see that people only watch like nine minutes of it or something like that. But it is what it is. Let's not get too analytical. This is just for fun. I did have fun. I think that's all I have for you guys. And I'm going to call it at that. We're going to continue Alolan Summer next week. And I'm recording these in advance. So I really hope, I really hope Alolan Summer has been doing good. It's a vision I had for a while. And if this is past Matt, so in the future, if my videos aren't doing too well, I'm going to be sad. But I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye.